They told me it wasn't no catching up, but just like it wasn't no room in the caddy. I had to lap them up. Now I'm in the gym doing two a days. Push, push, push. Now I'm in the gym doing two a days. Push, push, push. And I'm getting money in any way. All I know is going getting paid. My moving weight like every day. Now I'm in the gym doing two a days. Now I'm in the gym doing two a days. Push, push, push. Now I'm in the gym doing two a days. Let's run it up. Guys, welcome to the Run Up the Score podcast with me and my host, New New Washington. We have a, a, a legendary college coach on the show today. Uh, ha, has been at multiple, multiple Power Five University, most recently the wide receiver coach at University of Missouri, Garrick McGee. Coach, thank you. What's for going on, man? How you doing, Coach? We, we want to, um, before we get into it, we want to let you uh, run down your resume and some of the places you've been and where you've coached um, before we get into it. Man, you know what? Um, when I go out on a, um, a clinic or something like that, and it's time for me to speak, and they want to get up and introduce you and talk about every place you've been and all this crap, I always think that that wastes some of my hour to go in and start teaching. Right. So I go, most people know where I've been. Let's get to the business. Let's get going. Um, give me some real questions. Let's get going. Let's chop it up on here. Yeah, let's all right, all right, well, well let's, let's get straight into it then. Yeah, right, how you doing, know. man? How you man, been? I'm doing good. It's, good. it's good to see y'all. It's long time no see, right? You know what, though? Uh, I feel connected to you. Me and you went through a lot when your son was being recruited. Um, but y'all handled it the right way. All of y'all, and I hope I did too. You know what I mean? I just I knew that kid when he was in the ninth and tenth grade. And sometimes when you're recruiting a guy, like my style has always been get to know these kids when they're really, really young before they become prospects and really develop relationships with them and like talk to them about real stuff before it's time to talk to them about what school to go to. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is once it's time to decide what school to go to, then you can have real conversations with them about decision making. You know what I mean? And your son was the same. And I, um, you know, that kid, I think I, I think the world of him. I'm glad he's finally out there doing well. He's going to do well. Um, he's in a great place to play ball. So, hey, hey, hey Reed, hey, there's no lie, Reed. I said, hey, I, I said, hey, Coach McGee, man, I'm not lying. I'm finna take you over my mama house. Mm. I go to my mama house and tell her a lie, Coach. But that man walked in my mama house. Hey, that's my cat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Coach McGee, this is my guy. Hey, yeah. well, that's important though because we all had those same type of traits, man. Like mm -hmm. I'm not going in my mama's house lying either. So why would I go in your? You know, what I mean, you just respect um, our age group. You know, when we came through, respecting people of age that were older than you that had gray hair and all that, that was a part of how it was. And my dad was a football coach. And he, one day, he had a, um, he left school early, right? So I was in the gym. It might have been my senior year in high school. And I was a heavy recruit. And my dad left school early. He had to go home for something. And we had what's called six hour at my high school, where the last two hours of school on Tuesday, Thursday, we just in the gym playing ball. And one of the coaches did something. I don't remember what it was, but me being young and immature, borderline disrespected that coach, right? One of the coaches. Man, my daddy came up to the school, like left whatever he was doing and came up in the school and it embarrassed me as a senior, heavy recruit, totally embarrassed me in front of everybody before he even got to know what really happened. All he heard was, I disrespected an adult in the school. And he well, wasn't allowed the back then. That, that They yeah. didn't go for that. Yeah. You tell somebody, kid, now you're going to jail. Hey, so let's let's start out at Arkansas. SEC school, right? Yeah. You 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 the offensive coordinator, right? Yeah. Well, and the first two years I was the quarterback coach. Paul Petrino was the offensive coordinator. Right. So you used that with what? Felix Jones, right? No, no, no. Felix went to my high school. I hate to keep bringing my high school up, but it is what it is, man. We we one of those schools. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 um Felix was leaving. He was a junior. He came out early 
as we were coming in. Okay. So Felix was gone when I got there. Okay. So that that was that was your first coaching job in Arkansas, right? Did like your big opportunity? No, I was at North. No, not at all. Uh, it was my first coaching. Um, it was probably my first big coaching job in the set. Before I got to Arkansas, I was the offensive coordinator at Northwestern in Chicago in the Big Ten. Oh, yeah. Okay, okay. Before I got to Arkansas. Yeah, and then before then, I was at UNLV with John Robinson, the legend John Robinson. USC. He coached, yeah. that's right. He, he coached the LA down. Rams and Deacon Jones and um, Jack Youngblood and Eric Dickerson and all them. Man, he was the head coach at UNLV when I wor- I got to work for him. So, let me know. Head slap. Hmm? Huh? I say Deacon Jones, the head slap. Deacon Jones, yeah. Jack Youngblood. He used to talk about how long Jack Youngblood's arms were. That on 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 um on PAT field goal, even though he played defensive end, he had him as one of the wings on PAT field goal because his arms were so long he could cover up both gaps. You know what I mean? He was just and he he should always say, man, he should just stand there and go bang and stop both gaps. You know, he would tell those stories, man. When when we talk about uh let's let's talk a little bit about recruiting. As a coach, what is the number one thing you look for in the kid? Uh well, I think there's levels to this. I know that's a wrap, but I think there's levels <laughs> to this. All right. Okay. Okay. As and I've been very fortunate. As a head coach, you're looking at certain things. Does he fit into my culture? Is he coachable? Ultimately, is he going to deliver on the practice field and be a good teammate, et cetera, et cetera, and ultimately deliver in the game and help us win a championship as a head coach? As a coordinator, you're looking at it as, does he fit into the scheme? Which Does he um, does he feel our needs? Like, if I have um, two big, tall receivers and I'm searching for a little scat guy, and you bring me another big, tall guy, well, it's not really what I'm looking for right now, you know what I mean, as a coordinator. And then as a position coach, you're normally the dude that's out developing the relationship, getting to know the kid, getting to know the parents, the coaches, you know, the um, the lady in the cafeteria, all that. So as a position coach, you're looking for, is this one of my guys? Like, can I trust him to really let me develop him is he going to show up on time and do things right? Is this one of my guys? That's why the position coaches are the ones that's out in the schools talking to these kids when they're, you know, sophomores and freshmen nowadays. Not talking to them, but because that's against the rules. But what I mean by that is getting to know who that kid is mm-hmm. at an early age. So there's levels to what you're looking for. You know what I mean? As and, and all of that runs right back up the ladder when the assistant coach brings the information back to the staff. He brings it to the coordinator. He says, listen, I love this kid. That There's just something about him that I really like. Um, you know, I, I've been knowing him for a while. I've watched him develop and grow. Um, I've seen his parents at the football games, um, et cetera, et cetera. I've seen him sit up there. He's got support. I really like this guy. And you sell him to the coordinator, and the coordinator goes, nah, but that's not what fits right now. And emotionally, as a position coach, you've totally invested in the kid. Mm -hmm. But the coordinator goes, that's not, I'm looking for an offensive tackle. I'm not looking for an offensive guard or a center. That's how it works. I'm looking for a tight end to block the defensive end. I'm not looking for a flex tight end right now. And even though you love this kid and you love his parents and his coach, et cetera, et cetera, that's not what we're looking for right now. That's the coordinator's level. Then if it passes through the coordinator, then the head coach ends up saying, does he fit in my locker room? Let let me ask you this question, because me and and Reed bump heads on this all the time. Mm, That's a good one. Reed, me and Reed bump heads on a lot of stuff. Okay, you ready for this? (laughs) You ready? You ready? Here we go. Are D1 athletes, Division I athletes, are they born or are they made? Both. Both. Fat man, tell them what you said. I think they born. And they got they all got something that you can't teach. 
I think they may because with very hard enough you can do a few exceptions. I no, think, man, I, if, think they may. I think Reed, I um I'm glad I'm on your podcast so I can charge you up on your own podcast. I think you're wrong. <laughs> I think the reason you're wrong is because you're not giving yourself enough credit. I mean, you get a kid when he's in the ninth grade and he's been coached by the local firemen in coming up through Little League. He don't know how to play. He don't know how to show up on time. He don't know how to deal with all the stuff that goes on inside of high school. Like how you got to make appointments, you got to write papers, you got to et cetera, et cetera. You're dealing with that kid. And you end up developing a kid who had none of those skills. And then he gets done with you as a senior and he's got those skills and he's ready to come to a division one college and he ends up doing well and producing. You developed him. Now, when you first got him, Nah, he wasn't made. He wasn't born. He's a diamond. Now, now there are some kids that are just, he got it. I mean, get out of his way. Don't screw him up. Mm-hmm. But there's kids that are developed. That's why I think there's both, man. The art of development. I mean, my dad was a high school coach, man. We had guys that come in in the ninth grade. They weren't no real player. And then four years later, they're going to college to play. That's mm-hmm. the the skill of high school coaching, in my opinion. And then to get to the pros, the college coaches have to take it and move it on to the next level to give them a chance to play in the pros. That The high school coaches, the college coaches, give them a chance to make money. You know, Nuno, I see you over there looking at me like that. You know, because you, you know, I see boy, you. Okay. Hey, my son's just walked out here like, What's going on out here, man? Hey, we all quarantining, man. We all quarantining. They like, what's going on out here? Hey, one of your sons look like he's gonna be able to throw it better than you. I got one son that can really throw. I got one yeah. son that can really catch. Yeah, I, I seen and them it's both. It's weird how that worked out. Like it's like, man, I can't even because they. I mean, they're both. That's one part of what you're saying about being born with it. Because I, I mean, I play catch with both of them the same. Mm-hmm. But one of them has a skill to throw. The other one cannot throw, but he can really catch and move. Mm-hmm. Like they were raised in the same household and coached by me the same way, but they both have different skill sets. You know, mm-hmm. it's amazing. Wow. So, coach, you've been in, involved in some major recruiting battles over the years. Like you coached Lamar Jackson and recruited him out of Florida to Louisville. Is there a major difference? when you're trying to sign a national guy like Lamar and everything that kind of comes into that and also having the element of people talking about potentially switching his position and maybe recruiting another guy that might be a two or three star guy. What's the biggest differences in those processes? Well, um, since we're on the podcast, I'm going to give you some real talk. Um, since we're talking about, uh, since y'all are my boys. All right. 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 The thing, Okay, um, what, there's been a lot of those battles, but since we're, since Lamar is the MVP of the NFL, he's a good topic to have right now. He's the man, yeah. right? And since we find out he's going to be on the cover of the Madden, you know that. But Lamar came to us. He he walked in the door, and on the first day we went on the field and started running. We knew he was explosive. But the first day of the summertime, the NCAA rules changed, and we got to go out and do some um, on-the-field work with no ball. You couldn't form. There's certain rules that you have, but you got to get out and see him run. As soon as he took off down the field, we all looked at each other like, oh, my God. Like, he is a whole nother level. Mm -hmm. And then we kept moving out of the summer in the training camp. And we got into training camp, and we always believe with Coach Petrino, and I, I mean, I'm one of his dudes, we believe that after practice, you have rookie practices, or we call it developmental practices, and we build it into the time frames. So if you got a two-hour practice set, we only practice for an hour and 45 minutes to get a, the, the dudes that don't get a lot of reps at practice, give them reps at the end, real team reps where we're coaching them hard. And – we would see Lamar developing so fast at the end of those, at those practices that we were like, man, this dude, like we had a starting quarterback, Reggie Bonifant, who was a true freshman and started the year before 
and he was the truth. And now he's playing tailback for the Carolina Panthers, number 39, Reggie Bonifant, right now. He was our starting quarterback. He was from Louisville. He had went to Notre Dame and won his true freshman year. He was coming back for his sophomore year. Well, we said that, listen, man, Lamar is too talented to red shirt. Like, he is not sitting on the bench when he can score a touchdown any minute. But we got to find something to do with him. And so we put in this little package where Red, because Reggie was explosive too. He's a pro. Where Lamar would get in with Reggie and Lamar would motion out and um, we would throw a little screen to him or we would throw him a double pass or some sh something. And we were working on it in training camp. And this is facts. This is a true story. Lamar called me late. We, we used to have like walkthroughs from like 9.30 to 10 during training camp. And then they would eat snack and they would go home and then we would go home. So I had to get home about 10.30, close to 11. My phone rung. It was Lamar. He said, hey, man, I don't want to do that motion and out stuff. I want to play quarterback. That's it. And then we threw that shit out because we owed it to him and his mother. We were looking at it as we have to get him on the field and we have Reggie. We can't sit him down. He was looking at it as, I don't care if I don't get out there or not. I'm playing quarterback. And he was right. And we told his mother in recruiting, we are not going to screw with him because she was adamant. A lot of people wanted him as a different position. She said he's a quarterback. I almost fell for that trap. Mm -hmm. And Lamar said, no, nah, I don't want. And we threw all that out. And then ultimately he became the starting quarterback and all hell broke loose. You know how, what I mean? So how, how many, how many other people, do you think in the recruiting business would have been in the same position as you as like, you know what? We're going to, we're going to honor what we said we was going to do for the kid. It, it, Cause it seemed like a lot of people uh, had a school best interest first. I mean, well, like I, my, I don't know. I just know what I do. And my point was not, nah, I know what I told her. And when I talked to her on the phone, I said, I'm not lying to you. I'm not trying to go behind your back and do something weird. I'm just saying he's too talented to be sitting on the bench mm -hmm. when Reggie's playing. And we hadn't played a game yet. You know, we, we had not played our first game. This is training camp when these conversations were happening. And she understood, but she was like, nah, he don't want to do that. He don't want to do that. He want to play quarterback. So then I had to honor what, what, I mean, we had to, don't. I mean, I don't know. I, I do think that there's. Uh, I don't. All I know is what I do, man. And when when we had that conversation, it was like, nah. Then ultimately, he became a starting quarterback, and like I said, he went crazy. Reggie Bonifin, that quarterback that I'm talking about, moved to tailback. Now, now we had both of them, and then Reggie's mom initially was like, "What's going on?" And then I ended up explaining to her, "No, this is going to work out for everybody." And we had a good relationship because I'd recruited him a year before. And she trusted me. And now Reggie's in the NFL. It's to be his second or third year with the Carolina Panthers. He's him and McCaffrey are playing court, or running back for Carolina. He's number 39. So when you recruiting a Lamar and his mom is adamant that he plays quarterback and that he stays at quarterback, is it easier for her to call that shot or, or press that issue, rather I should say, because of how good he is. Can, any kid, parent, can any kid parent be that adamant? Or is it only certain people who can say that? Right. No, any kid's parent can say, this is what I want from my son. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, when my sons come out, they're not going to be like Lamar. But I have the right. I mean, I, it's my son. I can say, no, this is what I want him to do. And then if, let's just say, he gets to college and... The coaches are there with him every day. And the coaches say, this is what benefits our team. And ultimately, this is what's going to benefit that kid. Let's just say that happened. And they can call me as a parent I'm talking about, not as a coach. Because I got two athletes. If they can explain to me that this is what's best, then, you know, I'll say, what did the kids say? What did, what did my boy say? He would say, he said he's down for it. He just want to play. He's want to get out there his freshman year. He don't care what position he play. Then let it happen. But 
No, he said he don't want to do that. You know, he, he's a D-line, he's a defensive end. You guys want to move him to offensive tackle. He don't want to do that. He, he called me last night and said he's not interested in doing that. Well, I think nine times out of ten, good coaches, um, people that care about kids, they would understand that. They, it, You know, they would understand that, I think. You know, so, good coaches, like I said, good coaches that care about kids. Coach, at every level, and let, let's start at the NFL and college. Let's go to the two highest levels. Yeah. Every year there's a lot of talk about African-American head coaches and how few of them it is, right? Yeah. yeah. What, are, what are some of the things, that some of the reasons that you think the number of African-American head coaches is so low? And what are some of the things that need to happen to put guys in a better position to get some of those jobs. Yeah, well, I just think it's about like um, it's about networking. What I mean by that is um, people hire who they know and who they can um, hand the keys to. Like I trust that I can go home at night and sleep, and if a if a crisis comes up. This guy can handle this. That because the head football coach in college, they're dealing with 110, 115 guys at some places, 120 boys from 18 to 21, 22 years old. And they don't do the right thing a lot of the times. That age group of boys. Mm -hmm. they're still developing and still growing so when you hire a head football coach that person has to be able to manage all 120 of them and be able to be a crisis manager and uh, like he, he there's just so much going on so what happens is um the coach the assistant coaches or the, the you know you get to a point where you're a coordinator if that's the step that you want to take then you have to start positioning yourself for that step by expanding your networking base. And, and I haven't mastered it, so I'm just saying what I know, that you end up developing relationships with people on a broader level ju than just the X's and O's and I go to all the clinics and I'm one of the smartest and I can I can – move my X's and O's at a, you know what I mean? Creatively better than it. Well, no, no, no. That's not what you're getting hired for to be a head coach. Mm. And so I think that has a lot to do with it. Um, I think that I've always said in college, the first thing we have to do is flood the market with more minority assistant coaches than coordinators then, but we cannot have just a, a list of, three minority quarterback coaches in the country and thinking we're going to expand the number of head coaches. You know what I mean? We, we all as minority coaches need to go out and find five or six young um, coaches and develop them. Now that, I mean, like for me, I need to be in mentor mode right now instead of I got to grind for my career mode. I've, I've been a lot of places. I've been fortunate. I need to find some young 26, 27 year old offensive minded guys that know how to play quarterback and know how to coach quarterback. And I need to develop them into big time quarterback coaches or coordinators so that ultimately there's 10 guys out there that are that are offensive minds that are coaching quarterbacks and know how to carry themselves and, you know, know how to. That's what I think, you know, I, my responsibility is let, in helping this thing happen. Let, let me ask you this. Is it uh, – what would what would guys – say guys in St. Louis that's coaching on a high school level, yeah. how, how could they get into the collegiate game? It, that's a great question. That, and that's why I'm glad I'm with y'all because y'all – and I'm here because y'all go ask me some real shit. I mean, <laughs> stuff. I forgot we were flying. I forgot we were flying. Yeah, we good. We good. So what happens, man, is like I said, the the rules, the rules made it hard because most of the high school coaches that you want to hire are at schools that have players. 
because that's where you spend most of your time. So if you hire him and you don't put him on the field, directly on the field, then you're out on the players in that school. So it's like, is that worth it? Okay. Now, if you hire him and put him on the field, we, meaning the college coach and the high school coach, have to do a better job of understanding what's the high school coach's expertise. What, what is it? Like, like I don't know? want him. Like, if somebody would have hired my dad back in the day, right? What do you hire him to go recruit Tulsa, Oklahoma? Well, if I'm Barry Switzer and I'm at Oklahoma, well, I need more than I need a dude that can recruit Tulsa, but also can recruit St. Louis and Kansas City and et cetera, et cetera. You know, because ultimately that Tulsa pot, I mean, you're going to get three or four, but I need a so you have to understand what the um what the strengths are um in regards to recruiting meaning the organization and recruiting not he can go to one city and he can make it happen in that city i get that that makes sense but he also has to have the skill set to move around to different cities because he's coaching a position and he needs to go to um to dallas texas and find whatever position he's coaching, and he got to go down there and find some dudes. Like, he can't just be local. So it's all about, like, we need to ask um, high school coaches better questions when we're all together. Um, I've always said that, like, at high school coaches clinics, we don't really get to know the high school coaches throughout the years. Like, we, we get to know them as people. But we don't get to know them as coaches. So, so or, or is is it like clinics or something that the high school coaches can go to where they can network and reach out to college coaches? That because it's 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 a couple guys in St. Louis that, that deserve a shot. I think. What you think, Fat Man? It's it's um. Hold on. What you call? What, hold Fat, on. Fat Man. Oh, that's your name. <laughs> hey, I had a. I just did the um on my Facebook. Um, I got a lot of people from my home, people I grew up with on my Facebook. So I do um, 20 album covers that influenced the way I hear music. And uh, one of them was the Fat Boys, by the way. He said Fat Man made me think about it. But one of them was the Fat <laughs> hey, Boys. Back and I've been, seeing you, I've been seeing you do the, do the music thing. Um, and it, it's some real debates going on your page with that. And you know what the new debate has been on my page? Michael Jordan. I have a lot of people that are my age that don't think Michael Jordan is the best player of all time. I got some of my boys that, or some of my friends that think Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Some of my friends think LeBron. What about um, Bill Russell? We never. Well, we're not old. I'm not, I'm not old enough to where I saw him play. So if I didn't see you with my own eyes, okay. I got to back out of. Yeah, I can't. I can't say it. I you think, know, you can you you can take up a, a couple hours debating about Michael Jordan and LeBron and Kobe. Uh, you can if you're talking to the right person with me, you can. That's a smart you conversation. Know, the, the funny thing about that is, like, Jordan is clearly the best player to ever play. That's, like, not debatable. But if, okay. we, take this, but if we take this same argument, we take the same argument to football, right? Emmitt yeah. Smith is the all-time leading rusher. But the average person to say Walter Payton, Barry Sanders first. That's right. It's a different. It's a different sport. It's a different sport. I'm not. I was in a debate on Twitter for about five days about Emmett Smith. So I'm not gonna go back. I'm not gonna go into that right now. Um, Emmett Smith. He the best. He's not the best, but he's one of the best five. I mean, you got to say that. Yeah, that's that's a fact. He's one of the best five to ever play. Only because he's the all-time leading rusher. He has to be in the top. Well, you got to be special to be the all-time leading rusher in the history of the NFL. And then, you know what, though? There's some people that say, even though I agree, Emmitt Smith is top five. Mm -hmm. And I was fortunate. My roommate got drafted by Dallas. I was fortunate to hang out with them dudes when they were rolling. So Emmitt Smith is definitely top five to me. But there's some people that say, if you put Barry Sanders behind that offense, speak on him. It was running behind. Then be Barry Sanders might have went crazy. You know, even though he might have been two side to side, Emmett might have been perfect for them because he was just on the move downhill. But there's some guys that um, 
You remember Ahmad Green that played for the Packers? Yeah. The day? He played for the Packers. Yeah. He played for the Packers. He was a downhill runner like that. Just yeah. hit the hole hard. Like if he would have played for Dallas back in them days, like would he have went off to probably? Because you got to give Leon. I mean, Eric Williams. Well, well, listen to this. Everybody, uh, Big Nate Newton. Every everybody says something about the offensive line from Dallas. Like that's everybody's go-to. They had one guy that went to the Hall of Fame out of that. No, group. That's, that's Larry not true at all. That's Nate, very look Eric at Eric Williams. One guy, Eric Williams. Nate right, Newton, he you know saying Nate, Newton, not, Nate Newton not in the Hall of Fame. Larry Allen. Nate Newton could have, you know, he could be a Hall of Famer. His his play on the field. Was so Hall of Fame. He could be in the Hall of Fame. His extracurricular activities don't. Hey, so let me let me ask you this, Coach. Remember, you said it's levels to this stuff, right? To 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 yeah, right. So so let's say say this, right? Say you were at uh, you were at uh, uh, you were at UAB, and you mm -hmm. and you were recruiting the kid there. Yeah. The coaching staff shake up. And you end up at Ohio State. Is that same kid that you was recruiting for UAB good enough to play at Ohio State? Maybe. I Maybe. know this. I know this. Uh, when I was at UAB, um, Jordan Howard, who's still moving around the league, who was in a Pro Bowl his rookie year, Jordan Howard was our tailback, and um, Jordan didn't get recruited by anybody in the country, not one school except us. Mm -hmm. And he came in and played for us as a true freshman, sophomore. I was a sophomore. He played at UAB. Then he went to Indiana and became big, all Big Ten. Then he went to the pros after his junior year, and he was in the Pro Bowl his rookie year. Then, you know, the Bears in Philly. Now he's down in Miami making money. Jamari Staples was another one. I mean, he he signed with us at UAB. And then um, when I went to Louisville, uh, did, Jamari ended up, belt, I mean, graduate or whatever. He could leave and come to Louisville. And he came to Louisville and started in mm -hmm. the ACC. And man, I'll give you another one. There's a kid named TJ Green that was committed in that same class. And we had TJ committed. Um, he was from Alabama also. All these guys are from Alabama, by the way. Um, we had TJ committed. The last week, he got a call from Dabo Swinney and Clemson. And they said, we want to offer you a scholarship. The last, like the Monday when signing day's Wednesday. And he went. He called me because he had been committed to me the whole year. And I said, man, you need to go. You need to go. That I think that's the best thing for you. I talked to his parents. I said, I think that's what's best. He, they, they were like, you know, it, it hadn't happened. It finally happened. And you can play for them. And he, he's in the NFL right now. He went to Clemson, won a couple championships or whatever. He played on um on that um, defense. I mean, he, he he's – so it's happened. So, it's so happened. did that. So, so did that happen? And there's things like that come down to just evaluation, right? When you're talking about straight evaluating talent, I was with some of the top 2022 parents a few weeks ago, and they're debating and arguing about the stars. This kid a four star. This kid a five star. Mm -hmm. And I always tell them, kid, don't come down to that. And so, I what feel is sorry, man. I feel sorry for. Um... I mean, it is what it is. It's the business now. But I, because of the stars, because of the word, there's a couple of words. Stars, offers. Those two words, man, are tough words for parents and kids nowadays. Because it, it it's like the biggest thing ever. That's all that matters. What you about? Man, you know what? If you just keep in mind that... This is a process. Like, you're one of the top high school players in the country right now. That's it. You are not one of the top college players. But the development starts now. And you can get there if you commit to it. But how many stars does he have? How many offers does he have? And that that's a – I feel – but that's the game we're playing. So guys like me got to figure out how to – you know, play that game. Um, but Check that's out. the game we're playing. I feel sorry for parents. Do you, you believe? Know, hopefully, though, when you go in and you tell the truth to a parent and you get them to understand what this is really all about, that's when they end up saying, all right, 
you know, I, 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 um, I trust these people, you know. Do you believe, uh, do you believe when people say that kids from, uh, California, Texas, and Florida are better than kids from Missouri because they don't play year round? Do you believe that? Uh, no, I don't believe that. Um, I don't believe that kids, I think that they could be in bigger states. There's more kids. Um, like in Texas and California, Florida, there's more kids out there because they're bigger. There's more, the population is bigger or more. Um, but the number one player in the country could be from, I mean, he's the best player in the country. It could be from um, Kansas or from, you know what I mean, from Tennessee. That, that could happen. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't think that at all. Now, when you're recruiting, do you pay attention to the recruiting services at all, the rivals and the 247, or are you believing in your own evaluation? Oh, no, you got to believe in your own evaluation and the evaluation of your staff. Like, initially, the position coach is evaluating his area, right? So you have to believe in your evaluations to move it on to the coordinator. So how do a kid get on the radar? Uh, the way he gets on the radar is uh, the high school coach. Because when I, when you're in a school and you're evaluating this senior or you're recruiting this senior, well, there's a list of, you know, the list, really good high school coaches. They have the list of the juniors, the list of the sophomores, and the list of the freshmen. And then some coaches, they just think about the kid they got to get right then. But then there's other coaches that have their eyes on that junior, sophomore, freshman list also. And they highlight it and they make sure that's in the system and they keep that fresh on their mind. Do you and think so that's how you um, – I think that's how you do it. What, what, about, uh, what about parents taking kids to Friday night light camps? Is that a good idea? Yeah, it is. I think all camps are good. Um, just to – one, number one thing, the reason you go – is so you can compete with other people that are on the same level as you. That's why you go. Like now, guys will go to camp and they won't. They don't want to work out. Well, even if there's no good, let's just say we're at a camp and there's no good receivers at the camp, but there's five good quarterbacks, nationally rated quarterback. Let's say three. Because the chances of having five at one camp are slim. Let's say there's three nationally rated quarterbacks, right? That are, and they got multiple schools that really want them to commit to them. Well, just because there's no receivers there, that does not mean you can't showcase your talent out here. So just like this guy's a great quarterback, you're a great quarterback, there's another one over there. Y'all get y'all butt in line and let's get out here and get to work. And even if the, they can't catch your passes, you go out there and show your stuff, not to the high school or the college coach. You're showing it to yourself. You're like that guy goes first and then I'm going to go next. And if he makes a, uh, a great throw, then the pressure's on me to get up and make a good throw. And you compete. My dad used to take me, man, when I was, when I was an um, eighth grader, my dad was a high school coach. They, I mean, he, we were fortunate. We had a lot of players. He went to University of Georgia's football camp. Coach Dooley was the coach, Vince. And um, we went out to the, I was in the eighth grade. I went with him. And they let me be a part of the camp. Those were back in the days when um, college coach could do whatever they wanted. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, <laughs> I was a part of the camp. I got to run around, et cetera, et cetera. Then I went back. Like my, 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 right before my senior year, my junior off season, my dad sent me back to the camp. The first time my eighth grade year, he went with me, but my junior year, he sent me by myself and he said, yeah, you may be one of the best around here, but get out there, go, go compete with them and don't go out there and go on a tour and um, get to know the coaches and sit in the office and walk around with your little headband on. Don't do that. 
Go out there and compete with them boys from Florida and compete with them boys from Georgia and South Carolina and all them. Don't just compete with these guys right here where we were. That's how my dad raised me. So that's how I see it. When kids come to camp, you're not trying to show me what you got. You're trying to show yourself that you're just as good as the dude standing next to you so that you get back to your high school with confidence and you're ready to go. That's how it should be done. And nowadays, these kids have to get talked into that. Not a lot of kids see it like that. You know, there's a risk to going out to a camp and actually producing and performing. There's risk. I might not catch every pass. I might not. Yeah, well, then the real players just go play. If you're worried about dropping the pass, then this not, might not be the type of football for you anyway. Exactly right. You might be worried about dropping the pass on game day. So if you're a right. real player, you show up whenever the ball's thrown out here and you go. Do you believe it doesn't matter when it is? You believe it's true that all uh, they say uh, all Division One coaches they they not recruiting a kid that don't think he's good enough to play in the NFL. You believe that's true? I mean, I think that's the what we like to say because it's really good recruiting pitch. You know, but some kid, let's say you got a kid, Florida State had a kid a few years ago. He ain't a kid no more. He grown, but he wanted to be a doctor. Uh, uh, Roe, the guy Roe. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, that's an extreme situation, but nah, it ain't necessarily, you, you're looking for kids that are self-motivators, self-starters that want to be great in whatever they're doing. You know what I mean? Some kids might, I mean, the world is different nowadays. Hey, you, know, hey. you know, the world is different. Here go another one. Do you 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 want somebody when you're recruiting a kid? Do you want a kid that's a uh, that plays football plus something like football and basketball, football and wrestling, football and track, or do you just want a kid that play football and work out for football? What do you prefer? Um, now I'm I like kids to play all the sports. The more the better, personally. Now that's my opinion. I like kids that they, they're athletes, they're competitors. They just, like, if you roll the basketball out there, like, give me the ball. I'm going to play, too. Mm -hmm. I'm not a – or, you know, um, I mean, I like guys that – fast guys run track, don't they? I mean, yeah. look, they should. Fast guys run track. They should be running it. So – That's what I thought. Let me let me ask you this. Um, in the last probably four to five years, it's, it's been a little longer than that, but it's really blown up the last four to five years, the all-star seven-on-seven seven teams, right? How do you feel about seven-on-seven, seven, and is it having an impact in recruiting at all um, in terms of exposure for those kids? Uh, I think the because the coaches, we can't see it. We see what's on YouTube or whatever, but I think the impact um, is that you get to know other guys and you get to go compete against other guys so yeah if i'm a receiver and it's the summertime and i'm either out running routes with a quarterback why don't i go compete in the seven on seven team or mm -hmm. if i'm a kid i'm but i'm a receiver and i'm six five and i'm also a point guard like, am I going to play in the AAU basketball tournament? I don't care. I don't care. I just know he's competitive and he has the skill set to do both. You know, I just, as long as you're not trying to be shy about your skill set or trying to hide something, go play. If you're a player, go play. Like, I don't, I mean, who, are, or who am I to say to the kid that might be a draft pick in baseball and we're having our camp? And he got a baseball tournament, but and he's the star pitcher. Like, he might not get called. He might not get called. Because he might get drafted in baseball, too. Like, I just mm. think that's all about the parents. That's, I think good uh, college coaches see it that way. Speak, speaking, uh, speaking, of, uh, speaking of parents, is this something a parent could do to turn you off from their kids? Yes. What? Yes. <laughs> What's some of the things they can do to turn you off? Um, they can show me that the kid probably won't do the right thing when he's on our campus. How do you know that, Coach? Because his parent or his parents 
um, seemed like they haven't really pushed him to understand the difference between right and wrong. That his parents haven't taught him that. So when we're here trying to get him to show up on at six in the morning to work out, and he says, what? I got to wake up. Well, he's never had to do that before. His parents have never. So that's a, what happens is you go with the pros. He's a dynamic athlete. He's this. He's that. He can. Okay, now what are the cons? The cons is he's not as disciplined as you really need him to be, man. He might be a pain in the ass when he gets here. How long is he willing to wait for that pain to ask to change? Uh, you want the truth or you want me to lie? You want the truth. Yeah, you can always want the truth, baby. Well, it matters the relationship. It matters if the kid fits into the culture. If if you like the kid, I mean, like, not like them meaning you're playing favorites. It's that it's just something about this kid that I like. Well, you connect with him. Yeah, like he made like he was late again. Like, oh my god! But there's something about him I like, so we're gonna keep moving forward with him. Then there's another kid that he's um he's um Adrian Peterson. I say Adrian Peterson because he showed up to everything on time in college. He was. They said when they ran sprints. At Oklahoma, after practice, Adrian Peterson would be 20 yards in front of everybody. Like, nobody worked harder than him. He was the ridiculous talent. Well, let's just say he had some issues with some things that wasn't criminal. Well, his talent level overrides some of that. You would say, we got to work through this. We, The assistant coach got to get into him and get him to understand how important all this is and develop him as a person. He may be already developed as an athlete. Where, where his development, he got to catch up in the personality and the discipline and the doing things right. That's where he needs more development. Some guys are like that, that are these ridiculous talents. Um, so there's there's every kid is different. And then there's some kids that this is a bad guy. And you know what? So, he acts like his attitude makes it seem like he don't care about being around here anyway. Like he don't even act like he want to be around here. His body language, um, his personality, um, his um, his energy level. Um, he walks into a room and just sucks the energy out of a room. Those guys are bad for the locker room. So you just every kid is different. You got to evaluate. You know every every piece of you know what the kid's about. When it's time to figure out if so, you're going to invest and develop. You know, I think I do think every kid I think in every college, every kid comes in and all the coaches have their best interests in mind. And my I worked with a, for a guy named Randy Walker back in the day. And Coach Walker said, you have um, he would how would he work? He would say, you have the paintbrush. You're painting a picture that you want us to see every second of the day. And what picture is that? Do you want it to be this dark? cloudy rainy day or do you want it to be this up tempo sunshine and um this you got the paintbrush you get to paint it every day and the guys that paint good pictures every day those are the guys that you end up ultimately saying no i'm gonna hire him when he's done mm -hmm. coach the the older i get in the game and i see it more and more and you getting great too, man. you look not from my own players great hair too man you old hey it's I can't I can't get around the diet because you know we all on lockdown. So you know the uh the, the older I get in the game, yeah, I see this for more and more parents now, whether it's the kids that play for me or kids that are asking for help from other schools, that academics has been put on the back burner by a lot of people. And you said something earlier about stars and offers, but it's so many guys that are not taking you went out. What kind of position is a kid putting himself in if he won't do the schoolwork? If he won't do the what? The schoolwork? You can't get that part of the If he won't get the school part of it. Well, he's, I mean, he's telling you something. That's easy. If he can't get it, I mean, if he's not, it's different. It's two different things. He's not capable of doing it, 
or he's not willing to do it. Because the mm. guy that's capable of doing it but won't do it, that guy, you know, he some guys they need extra help. Some everybody's not the same. Some guys, you know, he's gonna do the he's gonna um he'll he'll end up a qualifier, but he's gonna need a lot of help. Because he just naturally don't have that. Man, I'm learning that right now. We're in this quarantine thing, man. They're all the schools to cancel. You know, I got a third and a fourth grader. So their teachers send their work every day, do the email, and then my wife prints it all out. And my two boys, we're fortunate. They have computers. They got to go in their computer and log on. And we have to teach them the math during the day. And we have to teach them their social studies and their sciences. I One thing, um, I don't learn so much about <laughs> to be truthful i'm kind of embarrassed to say it like when we're reading about the louisiana purchase back in the day way back in the day like it's like that's when louisiana and oklahoma there was a whole stretch of um things were bought that the land was like man but my point is when i'm dealing with my two kids one of them can just see it and get it. the other one he has to see it a couple of times and read it again and they're both brought up in the same household. They're both got the same parents. They're different. They're, they're, they're totally different. So we have to see it different when it comes to academics. You know, they have to be able to get the minimum work done, though, because you, I mean, what the it, rules that they say, if you don't have the APR, if your guys are not graduating, your university is going to take a hit. To what extent would you go to, to the, would they go to help a kid? To full the full extent. Okay. Full extent. Every That's every I think, and there's departments for that. I, I man, I'm not I think every college nowadays, man, the way college is set up um on every level, that okay. there are rules in place that kids have to get in your program and move towards grad. You can't play your second year if you don't have a certain um amount of hours your first some um two semesters on campus. You can't play your second. So you, the way the rules are set up now, you have to um, progress towards your degree to continue to stay eligible. So mm -hmm. I think most colleges are, you know, forced to do that, and the coaches know it. You know, most coaches think the guy that if a kid is coming out class of, will screw up the game. If a kid is coming out of junior college, what are you looking for him to show you for you to give him a chance out of a JUCO? Mm, I mean, I, I came from a JUCO. He's just showing me that, he, that this is important to him. Because guys are in JUCOs for different reasons. Like everybody's not the same. You know, some guys are in JUCO because they didn't get... I, I actually, I got a lot of my guys that they're not getting recruited on the level that they need to be getting recruited or they think they should be getting recruited and their dad's or my old teammates, and they'll call me and ask me, then I'll go send him to junior college and let him play. And he's going in as a qualifier, so he'll get re-recruited all over again. That is a different level than a guy that mm -hmm. um, just got out of jail and he had to go to the junior college first. And it, that's totally different. You know, so it's all different. Every kid's different. And every situation is different. Kind of going back to to coaching a little bit when we talked about coaching development. What are how important is it for coaches, especially young black coaches, to establish themselves as guys who really understand X's and O's instead of guys who just have relationships with players and can recruit players? Well, man, that that's that is a very good statement you just made because which one is more important? I've pride. I've took pride my whole life in do not put me in a cage, and that I will take. I, like my mentors, they've always told me that. Like there's certain people on the staff that when you're game planning, third down and uh, four to six, and it's the most pressure down. Those guys don't have much input on what scheme you're going to do. But then the other guys, then when something's going on in the locker room, that's going to affect the game. The quarterback had a fight with the receiver in the locker room. That's going to affect the game. 
Well, there's other coaches that go down and they can deal with that. And some guys that are dealing with the X's and O's can't deal with the quarterback and the dude fighting in the locker room. That I've took pride my whole career, and I teach this to everybody I talk. You don't get put in a cage, man. You could do both. You can do both. You can you can really have good relationships with kids and develop them and know how to mentor them and motivate them. But you also can study the game and understand what to do on fourth down and six when the game's on the line. And you also can watch during the game and understand what adjustments to go to. If they're playing this, they didn't do that on tape. Like This is their first week doing that. Well, now, I mean, I had a game, man where I'm not going to tell you the, all the details, but there was a game where we were playing a team, and at the time we were playing with two quarterbacks, right? One of them was an athlete. He was a freshman. He could really run, but he was young. The other one was a pure passer, but he was more experienced. He was older. Both were like the – third and fourth team quarterback because the other two had got hurt. So we were in a tough situation anyway. But when we have the passing kid in, a team would play four down and, you know, base coverage behind it, just base defense. When we put the other kid in, the athletic kid, they would go to three down. But they had never played three down, and we hadn't prepared or studied for that at all. So – even though the athletic kid might have been the best kid at the time for that situation, that wasn't the best thing for the team because our O-line didn't know how to – they wasn't prepared for the three-down package that they were running. Mm -hmm. So the best thing to do is stay with the passing quarterback and play against basic four-down defense because everybody knew all the rules and they could execute the rules to the four-down. Ultimately, we won the game. I ended up taking a lot of heat for not playing a certain quarterback at the time. But the reason was there, there it, it had nothing to do with those two kids. It had to do with the defensive structure that we were seeing based on what quarterback was in the game. Playing this kid gave us the other 10 guys an opportunity to produce and execute plays. And so – I think all of that's mm -hmm. important when you want to be a college football or a football coach, period. But you got to have both, man. You got to be able to manage, motivate the locker room, get to know the kids, be a voice in the locker room. But you also got to understand how to make the adjustments at halftime that can help you win the game. When you was coaching Lamar Jackson, did you know he was a pro? Yes. Well, talent-wise, anybody that saw him in the sixth grade knew he was a pro. In the sixth grade? Yeah, Lamar was the guy from – I mean, he's a legend. Like, you know those guys that are elementary school legends? With the kickball and shit, kick away out in the school, out in the parking lot. Yeah. Them dudes. He's <laughs> been that guy the whole time. That Lamar used to – that when he was a little kid, he's a le – he has – legends say he would score 12, 13 touchdowns in games. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So – yeah, we when I saw it, yeah, talent wise, there's not a there's not a more talented guy. Like, I mean, the guy rushed for more yards than Michael Vick, man. Michael Vick, I thought was a was was a um, an alien when he was playing. He yeah. was so fast and so athletic, and so he was hit from out of space. Mm -hmm. And Lamar is that level of talent. Do you think that this whole COVID nineteen Corona deal? Is going to postpone the football season? You know, I don't know, man. That, that That's – like, we are in a tough time right now in the world because, you know, we all are passionate about football. But, like, you got to think about it, man. We can't play football if the students can't come back to school. You know what I mean? Like, there's a lot that goes on. We're all narrow-minded thinking about we want to – you know, we want to play ball. We want to see college football. We want to see high school football. But so I don't know. There's a lot that got to go on, man. I I don't know. I just think we got to, you know, keep everybody's health in mind. You know, I, I don't know that. I don't know. 
You know, I don't have so one of the last things I want to ask you before we get out of here, your dad is, is a legend. prominent high prominent high school coach, one of the best ever, state of Oklahoma, Hall of Famer, right? Great program, Booker T. Washington High School in Tulsa, Oklahoma. How important was it to him that college coaches were honest and kept strong relationships during recruiting? And how would he handle um, dishonesty and people not coming, being forthcoming throughout the process? How would he handle people like that? (laughs) You know what? You my dude. You my dude. That was a setup. That question is a setup because you know the answer to this. You know my daddy was crazy, and my daddy didn't care about no high school coach, or no college coaches, because he would say, "I got the product. I have what they need. I got um, five of the top twenty players. I mean, I got what they need." So when they come in here, I don't have to be nice to them. But they have to be nice to me. They they have mm-hmm. to prove to me that I can trust them with my kid. Mm-hmm. I don't have to prove to them that they can trust me. I, no, I just talk to the next one that comes in here. Mm-hmm. Um, that's how my pops was. And you know what? Uh, a lot of these guys that are still out here, the older guys, you know, knew who my dad was. My dad was a different animal, man, when it came to coaching ball. My dad, now he coached way back in the day, you know, when we would have to give him our progress reports before we walked in. On Thursday practice, we would have to get our progress reports of our classes, and we would have to, he would be standing at the gate when we entered the practice field, and he would have his paddle, and we would have to give him our, um, our um, progress report, and if there was any D's or F's, there was SWATs right then on the spot. And if you didn't mm-hmm. have it, you couldn't even practice that day. We like, need more coaches like that. That's how my dad was. We can't do it like that now. The world is different now than yeah. it was back then. Like you could not. Um, he he just. I mean, he, there's a story. There's a guy named. Um, I'm not gonna say his name. He might not want me to say his name. But there's a guy. That spent some time in jail, right? That played high school football for my dad. And he spent a lot of time in jail. And when he got out of jail, he ended up having this like um this business where he goes and rebuilds houses. Does that make sense? He's a um I don't know the right term for it, but he'll find contractor. he's a contractor, right? Well, this guy was never the starting running back. I mean, we had Tony Brooks and Reggie Brooks, them dudes that went to Notre Dame. This dude, but he thought he was better than both of them, and my daddy would never give him a chance. Well, he told me a story when my dad passed away. He said, man, he had got out by then. He said, man, one day I was riding down the street on my bicycle, and I was throwing newspapers because I had a child when I was young. This is what he told me. And he said, your dad rolled up on me in his truck and he said, how much money are you going to make today throwing them newspapers? And he said, I'm going to make $25. And he said, my dad reached in his pocket and gave him $25 to say, get your ass back to school ASAP. Because he understood you do have a child. You do need to do something to make some money for that child. But at the same time, you're supposed to be in school right now. Mm-hmm. And then the guy, in the, this is when he was in high school. He never played, but he he went to jail. He got out of jail. My dad was in his house. Towards the last few you know, years that my dad was alive, he died of cancer. So there was a stretch when he had cancer. He was just in the house. And he went and bought some new furniture in the house because he was about to be in the house full time dealing with this cancer. And the people that brought the furniture said, the, the, the delivery guy said, this furniture won't fit in the house. We can't get it in the door. The, the furniture company. And my dad said, I tell you what, and he called that dude, the dude that he gave the $25 to on the bike. His name is Damon Owsley. I can say his name because this is a true story. He called Damon Owsley, who was dealing with houses. And once he had got out and Damon Owsley said, coach, I'll be by there in a minute. And he came by and Damon found a way to get that stuff in the house. And it's a story of my pops believes that I don't care if he's a starting tailback or not. It's my responsibility to develop this guy. And even though they're not going to like me right now, 
ultimately when they grow up and they're men, they're going to all be my guys and they're going to all come through for me. And that Damon, he told me that story, like not at the funeral, but about the time when my dad passed, when everybody was sitting around telling stories, that story came up um, that, that Damon Lazy told. So that's how my dad was. My dad, he also said this for y'all coaches. You need to tell all of them that he said that really good coaches understand how to train a guy's mind right how to teach him the game how to teach him like the um what our schemes are what their schemes are how they fit together he said great coaches know how to train the mind and the body meaning he knows how to teach him what to do but he know how to take him on the field and train the fundamentals and the techniques that can get that stuff to come to life. He knows how. That's what great coaches do. You got to be able to do both. But then he said, master coaches, they understand that every person was made of three parts, mind, body, spirit. Master coaches understand how to take it to the third level and coach the kid emotionally and his spirit and coach all of that because most of us just stop. We teach them what to do. We teach them how to do it. And that's it. But they don't understand that the kid's grandmother is at home sick and the kid emotionally can't execute right now. My dad would say, until you're coaching three phases of the kid, you're not a master coach. That's what my dad said as a high school coach. He told me that when I started moving into college. Always remember, you better coach all three phases of the kid or you're not going to get the best out of them. That's what my dad was on, man. I like that, Coach. We're gonna end this. We're gonna end this show on that note. Master coach. I wrote that down when you were just saying it. <laughs> Master coach. All right. Thanks, Coach, for having us right, on, man. See you later, Coach McGee. All right, now. See y'all. All right. Coach Garrick McGee did an excellent job on explaining to us how recruiting works. The son of a legendary high school coach at Tulsa Booker T. Washington High School who grew into a college coach himself and has dealt with recruiting from the high school level, junior college, and major college football. He also touched on how to build relationships in the coaching profession and some of the things that minority coaches can do to better position themselves to get college jobs in the future. I am Carl Reed. This is the Run Up the Score podcast. Keep working. I'm in the gym doing two a day. Huh? Thank you.